Hello, so glad that you were able to join us today. Um, yeah, so um, it seems like I have a delay. Okay, I think we're good. So welcome, so glad to have you with us today. Uh, we are, um, actually we're streaming live from the great city of Atlanta, Georgia. I'm down here for a conference and so, um, I greet you uh, in the, the matchless name of Jesus Christ. So glad that you were able to join us today. Please um, uh, I'll wait a little bit and allow some others to come on. But if you could please um, just mute your, um, not mute, but I uh, invite your friends, tag someone, share with someone. It's going to be a dynamic time that we're going to have today. And so uh, I look forward to uh, you being on here with us. So um, let me get live myself. Yeah. So welcome as you're joining us. Uh, we're so glad that you came on today. Uh, we um, are going to have a dynamic time. Uh, we've been uh, giving you some teasers. We really would like for you to consider registering for our upcoming uh, conference, Be Seated. Uh, we're calling it that it's an occasion for negotiation. And we say that an occasion is different than an event. An occasion is something that's set aside as a special moment. And so I believe even in the midst of a global pandemic that God has set certain tables, that he has 
uh, prepared us for this season, regardless of how difficult things may seem. Uh, God is with us and uh, he is for us. He is on our side. Nothing about God has changed regardless of the circumstances. We just have to rise to the occasion. Amen. And so um, uh, today uh, we have with us uh, my uh, friend from uh, many years ago. I met uh, Mr. Ford Taylor uh, several years ago, I guess maybe like 2010, 2011. And we were working uh, together on a team for a citywide meeting uh, that brought together the church, uh, business leaders, and the community uh, through an organization um, called uh, YWAM, Youth with a Mission. You may have heard of them. And so we worked together on that. And then afterwards, I spent some time uh, with uh, an organization that uh, he uh, was with. Um, um, excuse me. I'm getting instructions here. Okay. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay. I'm getting instructions to um, be professional and all of that. And you guys <laughs> uh, will be, won't be will be wondering what's going on. So anyway, uh, as I was saying, uh, he's also uh, helped to found an organization uh, called Transformation Cincinnati. And it did a lot of that kind of work, you know, uh, with business leaders, with uh, church leaders, with, uh, you know, just all kinds of marketplace people and trying to impact and influence our culture uh, for the kingdom. And so I'm very excited to have um, Ford with us today. I believe that he brings another perspective to the table, if you will. And uh, I didn't want it to be just, you know, um, church leaders or apostles and prophets, because I believe that the table that the Lord is setting um, during this season is a shared table and that we're going to get the maximum output and the maximum yield uh, of the harvest that's in the earth and the nations when we come together and we, we learn how from a kingdom perspective to negotiate on behalf of, of God is his earth uh, the inhabitants of the earth belong to him. There's nothing that doesn't belong to God. There's no one that wasn't created for God's, um, for his purpose, for his glory. And so even in the nations of the earth, God has purpose. And so, um, you know, we, um, a week before last, we had Apostle Brandon Bailey on, and we talked about uh, this whole notion of compounded harvest, accrued interest, um, so far as nation building was concerned. And we looked at a lot of the, the elements and things that have to do with that. And that was very dynamic. And I invite you, if you didn't see that, go on my page and look for that um, um that broadcast, it will really bless you. And then last week, uh, we had Apostle Shami Marajan from uh, the Netherlands on with us. And we talked about the whole notion of the people of God to have an understanding of what God means and his perspective when it comes to words like prominence and significance. And that if we're to have influence, we cannot worry about, you know, uh, and we can't go hide in a corner. Jesus didn't hide in a corner. Jesus lived a, a large and out loud for everyone to see, regardless of whether his presence uh, delighted them and they awaited him as uh, Anna and Simeon, they awaited his arrival or whether they hated him like the Pharisees. Nevertheless, uh, Jesus didn't shrink back from the call of God, the mandate and something that he had to finish within his 33 and a half physical years upon the earth. And so uh, prominence is something that's very rare relevant. It's something that, you know, uh, we must uh, dismiss um, a, a notion uh, in the church, you know, that somehow that that goes with pride. You know, if we're balanced and we give the glory to God, then any father that is great, any father that is, is, is all of his attributes, you know, those children are identified by that father. And so you don't say the father and mother are great and outstanding and say, oh, well, you know, the children, they're just okay. No, the children are great 
They come from a great family. And so our God is a great God and his people are great. And we represent him in the earth with excellence and with distinction because we want people to take note. If they take note of us and the spirit of God that's down on the inside of us, then that opens the door for an invitation to introduce them to our father if they don't know him and to his son. And, um, you know, so it, it gives us that. So today we're going to extend and talk about, you know, the conversation a little bit more. And we're going to talk about a lot of the work that, um, and I'll let him tell you, you know, his, his self, but a lot of the work that uh, Ford has been involved in has to do with uh, relationship building and things, uh, constraints that uh, hinder relationships. If relationships are hindered in geographical locations in, in churches and all of that, if those are hindered, <clears throat> then the intended yield, the intended output that God has for a certain season in a nation, that is also squandered and hindered when we don't understand what that season is for. You know, as Dr. Miles Monroe used to always say, you know, if you don't know or if you're ignorant to the purpose of a thing, then you will inevitably abuse the thing. And so it is with seasons in the earth. So it is with God's harvest. And, you know, one of the things that I've been saying I've been saying that um, last year, you know, um, in preparing for our conference last year, the Lord gave me this phrase and he said, it's the, the season of a compounded harvest. And um, the compounded harvest has to do with an accrued interest. And so today we're going to look at some of those things as we go along. But one thing that we need to know is that our God is a shrewd, businessman. He, you know, it started with him. The whole notion of business, of profit, of profitability, of success, that emanated, those concepts didn't emanate with man. Those concepts emanated with God himself. And so, you know, to turn and take a look at the Lord that, you know, his most precious commodity is souls in the earth. And so if we were talking about commodities, you know, on the stock exchange, you know, and, and we were looking at, you know, um, a natural things like that, I just want you to change your paradigm. I want you to look and look at the people that God has in the earth, that those are his most precious commodities in the earth, his people first and foremost, because they can reproduce his spirit in the earth, his mind and his will. They can bring that to bear. But also God, you know, uh, everyone that is coming to the earth has come into the earth because the Lord has need of those people. Amen. And they're not just here by happenstance. The first invitation that they were given, they were given to enter the earth through their mother's womb. And so the Lord had a plan for them, even by way of their entry into the earth. And I see my friends are joining me. Thank you so much for uh, coming on and uh, being with us today. So without further ado, um, Ford Taylor is the founder of FSH strategy consultants, also of Transform Lead, another organization uh, that uh, provides um, all kinds of um, counseling, consulting, um, you know, comes alongside and helps uh, companies, churches, you know, developing excellent leaders across the globe. And uh, he is also the author of a book, and I'll let him tell you about that, Relational um, Leadership. And so uh, without further ado, help me to welcome my guest, Mr. Ford Taylor. Hello, Linda. It's so good to see you. Hello there. How are you, sir? You know, if I was any better, I'd be two people. So thanks for asking. We don't need two of me. So let's be sure I don't get too much better. But thank you for having me on the program. It's an honor to be with you. Thank you for coming. And uh, I, I must put this in here before we start our conversation. I actually... Uh, desired that Ford be on our round table in our um, 
uh, for our co upcoming conference. Well, he had a schedule conflict and wasn't able to do that. But I thought, you know what, we're going to have him as the pre round table, you know, uh, a guest on here and just add that, you know, to the flavor of what the Lord is doing. You have so much to offer. Uh, I just thought that it would be dynamic, you know, to have you on and to add the peace that you bring to the table. So thank you so much for coming on. It's my pleasure. And thank you for the kind words. Yes. <laughs> so um, uh, as we start, could you tell the audience a little bit more about yourself and what you've been doing over the last several years? Yeah. So Linda, just in a, a short story, I was born and raised in Paris, Texas. That happens to be where I'm sitting right now. I'm visiting my mom. I went to school at Texas A&M. Uh, when I was a senior, I met my wife who was a freshman. So I stayed there and managed a sporting goods store. Mm -hmm. And we got married when she was a junior. Uh, in 1982, she graduated in May. And in June, we took over a company that was about to go bankrupt. Uh, it was a screen printing company. Okay. And, and over the next nine years, we were fortunate to have a lot of success. Some venture capitalists called me and, and uh, because what we would do is buy broken companies, fix them, and then go buy another one, put a management team in place, fix them and buy another one. And so I sold a part of our company uh, into a bigger organization. And over a 16 year period total, we found ourselves as the largest decorated sportswear apparel company in America. Now there's a good news and bad news about that. The, the good news is we have three beautiful daughters, uh, Whitney, who's 30, Emily's 27 and Quincy is 25. Wow. They were high schoolers. I think when we met, <laughs> yeah, they, they, yeah, you probably wouldn't recognize them now, uh, but, but in that ride to the top with your name, you know, at the top of all the trade journals in, in your industry, came with a lot of pride and arrogance and in that pride and arrogance, I had a big fall, as you know, Linda, with my wife and uh, thank goodness she forgave me. And, and when I told her what I'd done, I was sure she was going to leave me. But, you know, one of the biggest constraints that I think we'll talk about today is something that she did that very few know how to do. And when I said, I'm sure you're going to leave me, she said to me, why would I leave you? I love you more than anything. I forgive you. We'll get through this. And, Wow. Wow. Unconditional love and forgiveness that I had heard about in church my whole life. But I think that's the first time I truly felt like I experienced it. Mm -hmm. Good news. God got back a hold of me. And you've already talked about what happened after that. We started the Ministry of Transformation Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky. Uh, I was doing business consulting one day. One of my clients called me in his office and, and he closed the door. And he said, so when you go out and buy companies and do consulting like you're doing with me, uh, his particular company in 18 months did, uh, was 10 times more profitable, but six times larger. And he asked me, he said, how often do you get these kinds of results? And I said, every time. And he said, then I want to challenge you why you're not using this material to do your city reaching. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, if everybody, if all the leaders in Cincinnati really knew me, they would never follow me. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, we brought 30 people in a room. We took them, gave them all a legal pad and a pen. I took them through six days of training over six months. Um, after that, they said, this is life changing. Do it again. Next thing I know, someone came in, offered to do a PowerPoint and a, and a, a manual. I took all this information to my pastor and three other pastors in the city. and said, by any chance, is any of this biblical? It seems to work everywhere we go. My pastor came back and said, you have no idea what you have. I said, so it's in the Bible. And he said, yeah. And I said, where? And he said, go find it yourself. Uh, one of those other three pastors came to me and said, this is not biblical. Uh, a few weeks later, he came back and said, we owe you an apology. We've just never seen biblical principles taught this way. So wow. we, we continue to move forward. And, and so we came up, so they all told me to go find it in the Bible myself. So we had this program now called TL transformational leadership that we treat in, you know, companies and governments and churches and media companies and, and then we have a second version that we can talk about on this show uh, called the missing link. And so TL is basically sharing people with people, the biblical principles that work in their families and their companies. And ML is the missing link where we come back for people that want to. And we share with them a lot of the biblical foundations, the kingdom principles, if you will, that are in TL. There you go. And now we have a home in Cincinnati and we go back and forth to College Station, which is where we started the business. And so we we travel a lot up until this year and we're still traveling, but not on airplanes as much. 
Wow, wow, wow. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I know a little bit of the inside story and it's a, uh, it's a beautiful story. And, and one of the other things, you know, before we uh, get into the meat, I guess, of it and, you know, just ask you some questions and pick your brain. Um, have you like, you know, one of the things that uh, I believe that the Lord wants us to <clears throat> take a fresh look at is the negotiation skills that he has given us by way of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, when I even using these terms, like uh, someone said, I believe it was the other day, uh, because I said, you know, I believe that the Lord will delay a harvest, you know, and that we're in a we're in a season of a compounded harvest. And, and what I meant by that is I believe that sometimes, whether individually or collectively, that we are not mature enough to in, inherit what the Lord has for us. And so he pushes back, you know, and holds that and sets that aside and processes us, grows us up to in order for us not to squander what he would give to us. And so when I say a compounded harvest, a crude interest, that's what I'm focusing on, that the Lord is bringing you know, and has been bringing the body of Christ to a certain level of maturity and responsibility to handle, you know, even all of the things that we see going on in the earth, you know, in our own country with the racial tension, you know, uh, all of the things that are happening. But uh, meanwhile, back at the ranch, there's no season, no time on the earth that God is not God, that he's not seated on his throne, that he doesn't have all the answers that we need. And so we don't need, although we may be very concerned about what's going on, we may be, um, you know, it may bother us. We may have a whole range of emotions that go with the things that we see and hear. But I believe if we can be mature enough as the people of God, we can help to lead the way by, um, you know, uh, just helping to negotiate and navigate these troubled waters. And I believe that there's a destiny in nations and the United States of America, regardless of what her past has been, I believe that she has a destiny that she's yet to see and that we play as, as God's children, a critical role in that. So help me to see, you know, in your uh, kingdom negotiating. Have you seen and perhaps give us some generic examples of um, uh, real results that you've seen in the lives of people and companies and communities or whatever? Yeah, it's interesting, Linda. The you know I've been to church my whole life, and when I started reading the Bible for myself, I was amazed what's mm -hmm. in there. Okay. And so I'm going, to, I'm going to use your kingdom harvest for just a moment. Uh, you know, okay. we've done a lot of citywide events there in Cincinnati. And we were moving into an event in 2004, and we were having a three-hour prayer time every Monday night uh, moving into that mm -hmm. event. And, and I had to text this to myself because I knew I wouldn't remember it. And so I sent a text mm -hmm. to myself because I believed God was showing me something at that event. And in there it said, you'll get to live... To, you'll get to live long enough to see a day that, that when people learn to humble themselves before God and submit to one another, that as they find each other, you'll see an accelerated convergence of synchronized destiny. And so I do believe what you're saying. I believe we now are seeing an accelerated convergence of synchronized destiny. I believe the reason is more and more truth is being spoken uh, into the kingdom about kingdom. Uh, in other words, we've kind of lived in the four walls for a long time of yes, the church. Yes. But now, I know when I first started talking about kingdom back around 2002 and three, I actually was brought into a room by a lot of pastors and accused of witchcraft. Uh, but mm -hmm. now, and that's okay. I mean, I can handle that. But, but because, uh, you know, kingdom, let, let me give you an example so you can hear, you know, re real results. See, when you, when mm -hmm. you apply kingdom principles, can I stop you for a second, just mm -hmm. for the sake of our audience, before you go on, help us to understand what you mean when you say accelerated convergence and okay. synchronized destiny. Okay, so you've got all these leaders around the world. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, for example, there are movements that have taken over our country, and I won't talk, call mm -hmm. out what they are. 
let me, let me take an easy one, marijuana, okay? A very small percentage of people got marijuana legalized, legalized across our country. I, I, there's, I'm not I'm just giving you stats. I'm not judging, but a lot of movements that take place, it only takes three to 5% statistically of any organization to shift an organization. That's a family, company, mm -hmm. city, or nation. And so when I, so when three to 5% come together around a common vision, they, they shift their organization, two or more people. So a nation's two mm -hmm. or more people. And so all these movements that take, that take place, it's because a very small percentage of people come together around a common vision with common purpose, with common mission, with clearly laid out objectives, strategies, and action plans. And so for years, that's what we do when we go into companies, we go into governments. If you can come up with that, classrooms, you can make a difference. But if, like the Church of Jesus Christ, you know, between 45 and 50,000 different denominations, all these things like parachurch ministries, there's no such word as parachurch, okay? But my point is, we fall in those teachings. And so what happens is, a lot of people are out doing their own thing. And so because they're mm -hmm. doing their own thing, even though we as a church have plenty of resources, we have the truth. You know, we have the resources and mm. the truth to change things. But because of whatever reason, time, pride, arrogance, everybody does their own thing. And so what I believe God showed That's me so is that I would get to live to see a time that when those people learn to humble themselves before him and submit to one mm -hmm. another, that they would converge. They would start working together. Yeah. And when they did, we would see an acceleration that three to five percent, an acceleration, an accelerated convergence coming together more and more of a synchronization yes. of destiny that he's called each of us to, that we would work together to fulfill. My destiny gets fulfilled by working alongside a lot of other people who are fulfilling their destiny. So that's what that means by an accelerated convergence of synchronized destiny. Wow. Wow. That's so powerful, you know, powerful. And so um, from what I'm hearing, it requires um, a person to, um, it requires them to lay down their lives. It requires humility. Would you say that you've, uh, in your encounter and working with uh, companies, working with leaders, uh, families, husbands and wives, um, how has, um, just talk to us about some of the, the nuts and bolts, you know, of that training that you offer that helps to um, address, uh, confront, if you will, and alleviate the constraints that would keep uh, the convergence and the destiny from taking place. Okay, so I'm gonna do both of those because uh, the whole solving constraint theory and process is its own thing, but it works. Uh, but just to give you an example, I'll answer your question. Yeah, the definition of leadership we use is when you're willing to lay down your life for those with whom you lead or have influence. So we, well, let's start from the perspective. Again, we'll come back to the thing I was going to talk about truth a minute ago, and we'll connect this, the kingdom okay. truth versus what we've been operating in for so long. Okay. And so why do we use the definition, lay your life down for those with whom you have influence or lead? Well, because leadership is about influence. It's not about a job. It's not about a position. It's not about control. So for years, we've been raising up leaders that are all about motivation and inspiration. But what we're trying to do is say, let's take it beyond that. So it's not just inspirational and motivational. It's practical and implementable. And so laying your life down for those with whom you have influence. Remember, we have influence in five levels. One is we have influence up. That's to our boss. That's to our employees. Another one is across. That's with our peers. Another one is down. Okay. Now up is, I'm sorry, up is to our boss, uh, to our parents, not our employees. Down would be to our children, to sports teams that we coach, uh, to our employees. Uh, but then we have a fourth level, which is the influence we have over ourselves. Most of us, you know, we forget that we have influence on how we behave. And the fifth level is our influence with God. So why do we use the definition lay your life down? Because why? We didn't know this, but it's biblical. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commandment. I command you to love each other 
in the same way that I love you. The greatest love is when you lay down your life for others. And here's the best part of that, Linda, that this is where people, if they can do this, here's what Jesus says next. If you do that, I call you friend. See, everybody thinks he calls everybody friend. Read it. He does not. He calls friend those yes. who lay their lives down. Why? You ready? Because he knows you love him. Yes. Yes. But if yes. you're doing that, now look here, it gets better. And he says, if I call you friend, I tell you everything the father tells me. Mm -hmm. Now, that's what, so all of a sudden, when you're running your company or your family, your wisdom goes through the roof. Why? Because Jesus is revealing strategies to you because he goes further and says, you ready? Because a master that's an employer in the day that he lived mm -hmm. does not confide in a slave. That's an employee because people would enslave themselves to work for seven years. And then at the end of the seven years, they would get cattle or land. So it's a whole different term for slavery than what we understand today. But he says, if you do that, and so what did Jesus do? You're asking for specific tools. What did he do? So first he laid his life down. You ready? And he, you ready? He casted a vision, a yes. common vision that the, that the disciples had together. For three years, he casted vision. What did he do? Once he casted the vision, he did not control them. He it was not command control. He turned the whole organizational model upside down. Mm -hmm. And no longer did he stand at the top. He went to the bottom. And what did he do from the bottom? He taught, trained, and equipped the disciples. Okay, how did he do that? He gave them new knowledge, which gave them, uh, then he gave them some experience. He didn't just turn them loose. He walked with them. He let them experience it. Okay, and from the experience, he that gave them the equipping, the tools they needed to keep going. Now, once you do that, cast vision, search, teach, acclaim. I'm sorry, cast visions. Okay, serve teach, train, equip. Now you empower. Now the team can go out and do their role toward the common vision. And once you empower, you let go. So Jesus let go and evaluation took place through the power of the spirit. Well, when we lead that way, he says, when you lay your life down, I tell you things you can't know on your own. And I don't tell them to everybody. I tell them to people I call a friend. Well, what do you do? Lead like Jesus. That's what he did. And even if I didn't believe Jesus was the son of God, and, and, and here's a man who, who only led for three years. He started, right. with 12. he started with 12 and here's the good news for all you leaders. You ready? God himself, Jesus himself was only successful with 11 out of 12. Isn't that great news? So we don't, I mean, we don't have to have that pressure of being successful with everybody we work with. Yeah, and so yeah. then he went, all right, and he was looking for a practical tool, practical tool, lay your life down, cast vision, serve, teach, train, equip, empower, let go and evaluate and boom, look what mm -hmm. happens to your capacity as a leader to bring people together. So there's just one tool that we teach. Mm -hmm. now, when leaders do that and they bring their teams together, they learn how to resolve conflict. They learn how to host meetings better. Well, when we're doing that, they learn to listen better. Well, when all that happens, guess what? You now can stay at the table. Linda, we can stay at the table when we lead that way because we give up our need to be right without losing our passion for truth. Mm -hmm. When we can do that, we can stay at the table. We can have, we can make hard business decisions about how to be more profitable, how to deal with problem employees, but we can deal with issues like racism because we can stay at the table because we're going to lay our life down for each other, give up our need to be right, without giving up our passion for truth. Mm -hmm. Boom. We now can take on, which I'll talk more later, but I'll take a question first, a kingdom perspective mm -hmm. instead of a local church perspective. Mm -hmm. And we take on the truth of the kingdom, because you said something in your opening, I want, I want to talk about apostles, but we'll okay. come back, we'll come back, back okay. to that. Here. But I want, to, I, I want to shut up and let you say something first. Oh my goodness. I guess you agree with me, audience, that this is powerful. And, um, you know, just how I hope that it would unfold. But um, one of the things that uh, um, I wanted you to help us, you know, with is um, the whole um, you were you uh, when God changed your life, you were a businessman. 
successful, you know, in corporate America and all of that. And uh, I believe during that time, um, the whole notion of marketplace ministry was very new, you know, and that I believe that the uh, the majority of the church was very hostile to that uh, concept or that idea. So help me to understand uh, or help our audience, you know, to see what were some of the things that helped to get you past that, you know, and to cause um, there to be more openness from the church, more joining arms, you know, for the sake of a community or a city or whatever. Okay. Uh, well, I started presenting this chart in Cincinnati very early on uh, before I had real insights on how the church worked. I actually got accused of, you know, uh, one guy actually said to me, he said, your problem is you have faith like a little child. You don't know how the church works. And I said, am I supposed to say thank you or be offended? OK, but my point is, I didn't know how the church worked. Mm -hmm. And so I presented this chart that I called a kingdom perspective. Mm -hmm. And I talked about that if the church leadership would work alongside Christian business leaders, government leaders, uh, arts, entertainment leaders, media leaders, I called them community back then. I've changed it to family because that's kind of uh, an agreed upon thing. Uh, you know, it, it, and so I had these seven things written down and it was in Transformation Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky. I had never heard of the seven mountains or cultural influences. I had never heard any of that. Mm -hmm. well, a few years later, when I heard about that, I started meeting these guys and so the two words that I had different, I just changed. I didn't care. I mean, this is God's strategy, yeah. not mine. And so when I was sharing this, uh, I mean, we were seeing miracles. I was raised Southern Baptist. I mean, the mm -hmm. first time that I shared the message at the Aronoff Center, the convention center in Cincinnati, mm -hmm. around changing the city, I stood before the leaders four times in the same day so people would have an option. And I said on video, don't worry, I'm Southern Baptist. I don't believe in the prophetic but God sent me here to tell you this. Okay. So my point is and the vineyard pastor was there and he said, come on, we got to talk. And so I didn't know how it worked, but I did start realizing from a kingdom perspective. So Linda, let me give you the difference in a kingdom perspective. Okay. The kingdom is made up of all those major cultural influences. You can call them mountains. You can call them infinity spheres. Yeah. I love the term mountain. If we can just throw the theology away around mm -hmm. it and just make it a strategy. And, I, and one of these days, I'll share with you the Great Awakening Project, which has just started, where leaders across this country are working together, and they've asked me to, to actually lead the business mountain. So, but my point is, let me show you a kingdom perspective, okay? So Jesus, when he was on earth, he used very, very secular terms when he spoke to people. He used Greek terms. He didn't, a lot of times, he didn't use Old Testament terms. He could have but he chose not to because he was trying to get us to understand a kingdom perspective, not a synagogue perspective. For example, the word agape. Okay. The word agape for God. So agape the world that he gave his only life. Well, agape was a Greek term. It was not a Hebrew term. And, and in Greek, it, it was this unfathomable. It was something that you could not reach. It, it was this thing that was out there. That, you, that you'll never be able to love that way. And he was trying to say, that's how much you're loved. Okay. Uh, another one, apostle. Okay. Apostle was not a church word. You know, he could have used kings. Right. He could have right. used priests. He could have used judges. He didn't. He used the word apostle, a mm -hmm. Greek word adopted by the Roman empire. empire. Yes. That mm -hmm. was the lead ship that went in to conquer cities. Yes. As they conquered cities, what they were finding is when they went back home, these cities would revert back to their old culture. So what did the emperor do? He sent apostles and gave them governmental authority. They took in teachers, business people, arts people, and they put the Roman culture into the city that was a different culture. That's what apostles did. It was not a Christian word. It was a secular word. Now, let's let's go one more and then I'll stop on that. OK, but we have to know these truths to understand why the kingdom works as opposed to just the local church. And so when when he looked at Peter and he said, Peter, who do you say I am? Peter said, you are Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. What did Jesus say? 
He said, Peter, based on that, and he used this word uh, 112 times, I believe, this apostle word, Jesus himself. Paul used a little bit different word, but this is what Jesus used, okay? He said, Peter, based on that fact, I will build my ecclesia. He didn't say temple. He didn't say synagogue. He said ecclesia. Why? That's a, a Greek term that Rome used. You ready? And it means you have governmental authority in the marketplace. Yes. So what Jesus was trying to say is understand love. Take the culture of love and forgiveness, Christians. You, you people that are following me, take that culture. You are an apostle. Now take that culture into cultures that don't believe this. Take your business, uh, take your architects, take your education, take the church, take this into that culture as apostles and infiltrate them. You ready? With the ecclesia. You ready? Definition. The sent ones with governmental authority. Now, now think about that. Jesus did not use religious words. Because he's trying to tell us it's about the kingdom. It's about taking this culture into that culture. And when we realize that, and we realize that 3% of the body of Jesus Christ makes their vocational income as a full-time missionary or pastor. Say that, one, say that once more. 3%, 3 of the body of Christ around the world approximately make their vocational day-to-day -day income is a full-time pastor or missionary. Linda, that means that 97% of us, that's you and me, mm -hmm. we make our vocational income in one of those other spheres. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to take what we learn and infiltrate our spheres with the culture of Jesus. And so when I, I challenge people, if the king, your kingdom come into my home, your kingdom come, Jesus come in, your kingdom come into my house, your kingdom come into my business, OK, because I want my house and my business, your kingdom come here as it is there. Would he be comfortable? Would he walk into your company and go, yeah, this is a place of peace, patience, open joy, long suffering, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, full of meekness, mercy, grace and humility. Because in that place, we have God's power, his honor, his authority, his glory. Why? Because he gives us wisdom like we've never heard, had before. And when those fears come together. We now have a kingdom perspective. And part of that kingdom is the local church, which should, in my opinion, should be the teaching and training and equipping center to send us out. Yes. Yes. All right. And I'm going to say one more thing. Then I'm going to be quiet. OK. Mm -hmm. uh, I started to write a book a while back and then and I decided not to write it. But the name of the book was going to be called The Two Legged Stool Cannot Stand. Mm -hmm. Because we, we, we have this thing that we call the Great Commission. And we call it preach the gospel and make disciples. I think if you'll look closer, most of the time it says spread the gospel and make disciples of nations. Why? Because nations are kingdom. If it's just make disciples, we're only making them inside the church. But look at what he says. But Jesus has a third leg of the school stool that I think we've missed. What is that leg? He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And in Greek, you ready? Justice and righteousness often are the same word. Mm. So if we didn't have the American twist, the English twist, here's what it would say. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his justice and righteousness. Mm. Then all these things will be added unto you. But mm. see, if we understood that, Linda, we would not allow the media and politics to mm. separate the kingdom. Wow. Justice wow. issues, purchase mm. issues. Mm. And we mm. pray to it. But listen to what this is the best part about the kingdom. Mm. He says, preach the kingdom. I want you to hear this. Preach mm. the kingdom, then raise the dead. I mean, listen to what he says. Preach the kingdom, signs, miracles, and wonders will follow. Mm -hmm. And so if signs, miracles, and wonders are not following you around, your denomination around, you individually, your business, I got news yes. for you. You're not preaching the kingdom. Because if you preach uh -oh. The kingdom, uh -oh. sorry, that's just the truth. If you preach the kingdom and you spread the gospel, mm -hmm. that's the love and grace and forgiveness of Jesus. You spread that around, guess yes. what? It will be intoxicating. And people will say, I want to be like that. Now you make disciples, you ready? 
that are apostles that become the ecclesia mm -hmm. and now we influence the culture. Wow. 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 This is um, just leading right where I wanted to go, you know, and that was uh, Ephesians uh, 4, 11. But, you know, the, um, I want us, you know, I think, um, I, I think I would be remiss, you know, um, in the culture and what's going on, you know, even uh, yesterday's news, you know, with the outcome of Breonna Taylor and all of that, you know, how do we, you know, you're Caucasian American, I'm African American. Um, how do we, is it possible, you know, uh, to remove the constraints? And I, I love what you said, you know, uh, and I, two things, you know, that come to mind. One, that um, if we, you know, love like Jesus, and so the opposite of love, you know, in, in several places in the scripture is not hate, it's fear. And so, you know, uh, how do we remove or, or what are some things that you found that work with, um, you know, cultivating relationship with your African-American brothers and sisters or neighbors or whatever, you know, uh, how have you found it helpful to remove constraints, you know, um, uh, create dialogue, have conversations, and not just about the easy, you know, kumbaya, fuzzy love kind of stuff, but like the kinds of things that are going on now. I love, you know, um, your um, translation of, um, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and adding the whole justice piece in that, and how some people really believe that we could be seeking God and not ad not address justice, you know. Um, how do we um, how do we how get through to? How do we get past these big pink elephants that are in the room that want to shut down everything, you know, and cause the whole um, whether it's our country or someplace else, you know, to just go up and smoke and leave people hopeless. Uh, you know, discouraged, angry, and everything else. Uh, well, Linda, the, you, you said it, 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 there's a couple of things. So I'm going to go to your constraint question to answer this one. Okay. Okay. Um, years ago, a lot of the pastors in Cincinnati said, okay, you're a business guy. What's the number one constraint in Christianity? And I said, well, give me some time. Okay. Cause I, I, mm -hmm. this will take a time because, because mm -hmm. the whole theory is if you can identify the constraint, you can exploit it. You can squeeze it, which means you can get everything you can out of it. And then you then you can subordinate other things to that constraint, which means it becomes the thing to deal with. OK, and then you elevate that thing to the top. And when you elevate it now, let's deal with it. Let, let's don't let's don't let it hang out there. And what you'll find is that almost everything else that we deal with is a symptom of that constraint. Now, once you solve that constraint, it's solved now, then one of those symptoms now becomes the next biggest constraint. Does that make sense? So, so yes. it's, it's solved that one. And once we get that one done, then this next symptom comes up. And so mm -hmm. I, I went in and I researched it and I went back to the pastors and I said, I believe the number one constraint in the church system is the lack of faith. And, and, I, and they asked me to say, why? I said, well, because, you know, God says fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Well, if we fear mankind or if we fear the devil, guess what we can't get? We can't get wisdom. And so the first thing you have to do is evaluate yourself, like Paul said. You know, first he says in Romans 12, 1, I'm, I'm going to connect all this. In Romans 12, 1, he says, let your whole body be a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Now, listen to what he says. This is true and proper worship. And so everything we do is worship. So first of all, come to the conclusion that your work is your worship. Your emails are your worship, how you treat your spouse. So that's number one. Then he says, don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by changing the way you think so that you can know the perfect, acceptable, pleasing will of God. The next thing he says, the first thing to do now that you understand that is do a personal evaluation based on your level of faith. OK, mm -hmm. 
And so, it, so we have to look at ourselves, how much faith do we have? Now, if we believe God's word is true, okay, that's faith. Okay, only 6% of Americans that claim to be Christians have a biblical worldview, which means the Bible says it, let's do it. So there's part of the problem. But, but if we have that kind of faith, Linda, and we, and, we can move, if, and we can solve that in our individual lives, that my faith in God, it's more important to me what God thinks than it is what you think. Mm-hmm. Okay, Then all of a sudden we can keep moving. And now what becomes the number one constraint? Love. Okay. What's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord God emotionally, physically, spiritually, and mentally. And the second one in Greek, the second one is equal to the first. All right. Well, I have a theory. We do love our neighbors. We love ourselves and there lies the problem. Mm-hmm. But once we understand how much we're loved, mm-hmm. now that's the one we have to solve. Now, once that one gets solved, the next one is what? Father, forgive me. And you, keep, you keep talking. Keep talking. Okay. Father, forgive me as I forgive those who sinned against me. Now, Jesus in the original text didn't say, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The next words out of his mouth were, for if you forgive those who sinned against you, the heavenly father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive those who sinned against you, the heavenly father will not forgive you. So what happens now? If we can solve those three big ones, my faith is more in God than it is in my fear of the devil, or which means I put faith in the devil or I put faith in mankind. And so if I put my faith in mankind, that's who I fear. If I put my faith in the devil, if I fear the devil, that's where my faith is. So if we put our full faith in God, then we start realizing hope. The next thing is love him, love each other. How do we get there? Learn to forgive all those who harmed us. And so what happens is, because if we do, we feel forgiven. And in that place, you ready? We quit being part of the problem. We become part of the solution. And now we stay at the table and we have those conversations you're talking about. So early on in Cincinnati, Linda, I went to many black leaders and I said, what would it take for me to get you to trust me 100 percent? And consistently they said, that's not possible. It's not your fault. You're six foot three. Back then I had blonde hair. I know my wife still loves me. But she still <laughs> loves me. I got blonde hair. But my point is, uh, you know, you're six foot three. You got blonde hair. You got blue eyes and you're white as a sharp belly. And so it's not your fault. You can't. And I said, well, what would it take? Because what if I die on my sword? To make that happen, as you know, Linda, the relationships that we now have in Cincinnati, mm-hmm. because people sit mm-hmm. down on our floor and let's stay at the table. And I learned, I learned all. I, I'm not saying I've learned them all yet. I've learned, mm-hmm. uh, hopefully, most. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping all, but all those things that I did as a white man, that I was completely oblivious to, completely ignorant of, completely blind to, because my mm-hmm. black brothers and sisters loved me enough to stay at the table. And say, Ford, when you say that, this is how it feels. When you act this way, this is, and I mean, I, I cried. How many tears have I wept? Mm-hmm. I'm completely clueless that that's the way it came across. Mm-hmm. And so here's what I tell my black friends. I mean, my white friends. Let me ask you a question. I said, most of you know that I cheated on my wife. And you know that she forgave me. But what would she do if I kept cheating on her? How would she feel if I kept doing the same things over and over again? You know, we'll be married for 40 years in January. I said, well, let me ask you another question. She forgave me. What if every morning she walked out of our bedroom and she saw pictures in our living room and kitchen of the women that I cheated with? Wow. What if we drove around town? Mm. And, I, and we have a pretty good history, but there's a few years we have a bad history. What if she rode, drove around town? All she saw was statues representing the worst part of our history together. And, and then I share a story that a, a friend of mine wrote a book. And I said, by the way, I wouldn't do that to my wife. And if I wouldn't do it to my wife, why would I do it to my brothers and sisters who have a different color of skin than I do? 
So a friend of mine asked me to write the forward in his book. And in the forward, it was just my story. And Sandra read it. And I came home one night and her countenance was not normal. Mm-hmm. I could tell she was frustrated with me, Linda. And as a man, I had this clueless thing and I had no idea what I'd done. <laughs> and I kept saying, honey, what did I do? Finally at dinner, I said, I don't know what I did. I'm probably going to keep doing it if you don't tell me. And then finally she said, it's the forward in the book. And I, I looked at it and I said, you ready? See if you hadn't heard this before, Linda. But, 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 mm-hmm. but about this, mm-hmm. about that. Mm-hmm. And that's what it's saying. But honey, it's on YouTube. But honey, you sat in the audience and heard me speak on it. Mm-hmm. Honey, it's in all of our training. Mm-hmm. Honey, we've helped lots wow. of people. I mean, and so I was giving her all the excuses. Does that mm-hmm. sound familiar? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then after about an hour, I finally got it. Honey, when you wrote it as the forward, it was history. Mm-hmm. You stand up and talk about it. People can see the pain, mm-hmm. the anguish the regret because you tell people it was all your fault. You say it. She doesn't agree with that, but she says it. you stand up and say, this was 100% me. I did it. My wife did not deserve it. Mm-hmm. You presented for it. But in the book, you memorialize something that people cannot see the pain. So here's the difference. We as a country, we've not ever said we're wrong. Mm-hmm. We've never stood up and said racism and slavery is wrong and we've never repented for it in a way but yeah we've done lots of feet washing we've done lots of repentance but we haven't changed our behavior we mm-hmm. haven't changed the prison system we mm-hmm. haven't changed the legal system we mm-hmm. haven't changed the workplace system and so so how many times am i going to ask my black brothers and sisters to forgive me mm-hmm. not change anything mm-hmm. and so what happens linda we as the church because we have the solution, we have to be careful because we are divided on justice and righteousness issues. And the reason we're divided is because we're getting sucked in by the media. And I tell my white friends, the next time you tell me a black person's being duped, I'm going to hit you. You're being duped as bad as they are. All the Christians are being duped. And we're getting drug in to the extreme right or drug into the extreme left. And most of us don't live there. That isn't our belief system, but Mm -hmm. we have to choose. I love my friend, Tracy Hunter. She said, oh, what you're saying is we have to choose between the lesser of two evils. I said, Mm -hmm. I'll use your words, but we don't have a choice because we don't, I'm gonna say it boldly. We don't have influence Mm -hmm. because we say we have faith. We say we love and we say we forgive, Mm -hmm. but our behavior is counter Mm. what we say and mm. when our behavior lines up with our words we'll have influence and we'll quit going in the problem we'll stay at the table god will pour his wisdom in there mm. are answers he has them we'll become the solution then we'll mm. have influence. And, and and linda that's kingdom, mm. that's kingdom. amen Amen. You know, um, thank you so much for that. You know, and I um, one of the things that I strongly believe, you know, in all of this is like if Jesus walked the earth and he did not leave the spiritual component of the enemy and his influence in the life of people, he didn't make that hush hush. He didn't sweep it under the rug. You know, when he encountered a demon, he dealt with the demon that was in the person. The demon was the constraint in the behavior of the person to keep them from being able to fulfill, to act, to think, to whatever, you know. So sometimes it's like, um, you know, one of the things that I believe is that in covenant relationship with the Lord and and we're going to round round up. We'll just have to have you back on for a part two. But um, I believe in having a covenant relationship with the Lord that that first and foremost, as you said, it gives us wisdom. It gives us access for revelation. When we have revelation, then the Lord can show us 
what is the constraint, you know? And if it is a spiritual phenomenon that causes confusion, causes hatred, causes division, schism, discord, whatever it is, then I believe, even as you said in the beginning, you know, if, if, if just a small number of us will get a hold of, you know, that we're dealing with the, the leaves, we're dealing with the, the shoots, you know, the fruit of it, but we've not gone to the root level and dealt with the spiritual entities that are at work to keep the division going. And that if we will concentrate and, you know, as uh, people of prayer and people of revelation, people of uh, that have been given jurisdiction, people that have a say so about what goes on where their feet are planted. And if we will begin to address the adversary that's at work, whether through the media, through whatever he's using, and become cognizant that that's what I really need to focus on, you know, and um, to call, you know, we even look at James, you know, and it says, it talks about the two different kinds of wisdom and where the earthly sensual wisdom, you know, it emanates from below, you know, and it describes it. So I think if we could even look long enough, you know, as leaders in and outside of the church to see what am I saying? Where is this wisdom coming from? And to, to, to say, no, if I'm going to deal with the scripture, then on the other side, if someone's not listening, they're not hearing, you know, they don't see the problem or whatever. Well, it's like that, that should say to me as a prayer point, they are blind as a bat. Something has caused them not to be able to see and to begin to target that as a root that that has to be moved out of the way because it's hindering the progress, that there's something that God wants out of a nation, out of a people, out of a neighborhood, and that we have a responsibility, you know, to to attack those things, I think, at all levels, you know, at the level that, that you deal with, you know, on a daily basis, you know, having the word of God in you, you know, being a business person and bringing forth wisdom and relationships and all of that, and then others you know, that that prayer uh, is something that God causes them. We all should, you know, pray, but concentrate on the root systems, just like you would, you know, uh, in an army. Uh, everybody has their specialty and their part to see to it that ground is taken, that the battles are won and that. And so we'll definitely, you know, uh, have to come back again. But I have great hope for our country, I, I, I just believe, you know, that in the darkest hour that the Lord is inviting Zion, arise and shine and let the glory of the Lord be risen upon us. And, you know, the Lord has also said that where sin abounds, that grace abounds much more. And so I want us and want to encourage those that are listening now on the live and the replay to focus on, you know, the light of God, the glory of the Lord to look at, you know, and to believe that, no, there must be a greater level of grace that's at our disposal. If it's this dark and if sin is this prevalent in the form of hatred and bigotry and division and all these things that we see that, no, we're going after our father's harvest. Our father has something that he's waiting to see in the earth and we are his children. He has given us the capacity to do something about it. And we're uh, going to stand up and say, not on my watch. You know, it may look bad, but this something great and wonderful is going to come out of this. So I thank you so much uh, for coming on with me today. I think it's been dynamic. We've learned, you know, and so um, if you've been on with me, I see all of my buddies. Uh, hi, uh, I don't want to leave out anybody, but Apostle Shimey, uh, Renee, uh, Holly, Stephanie, uh, thank you guys so much, Steve Lillard um, and um, uh, Apostle Steve Lillard, I, Lillard, I should say. And uh, I saw my sister-in-law was on earlier uh, from Nigeria. And so all of you, whether I called you by name or not, thank you so much for coming on, being with us today. Please do share, like, tag someone else. Uh, you can even start a watch party. I believe it's a conversation that's much needed in the body of Christ. 
advice that we have to keep at it. We have to not give up on, you know, God's harvest that's in the earth, uh, in the nations of the earth. And uh, I believe if, if that will be our um, our mindset and, and let me not be uh, remiss before we get off uh, in inviting you, because all of these pre-conversations are leading up to our conference next month, October the 9th and 10th. We're having a virtual experience, be seated an occasion for negotiations where, you know, God is releasing revelation to dynamic lineup of speakers and leaders that will be with us. And so please do, um, you can, um, uh, tag your your phone you know to the QR code there which will take you to registration also on my pages there's the link there that will take you there directly and so we're encouraging you to uh, go ahead and get registered it's only fifty dollars not much you know for uh, the investment of what the Lord is going to do and uh, you know go ahead and gift somebody and say I got something and just sit aside some time and and we're going to have a time in the Lord Lord. Amen. And so my brother, thank you so much again for coming on and, and being with us. And, and I'll let you know uh, about around two. <laughs> thank you. I look forward to that. Maybe we can step into that, uh, that warfare okay. to control manipulation, convoluted communication and sacrifice that's taken individuals would, down, which has taken the country down. Linda, thank I would you. love that. Love that. Yes. Uh, thank you for what you do. Sorry, I can't be with you that month. I had a family commitment. Uh, but you're a blessing. Uh, thank you for loving me enough in these years to be one of my teachers to help me understand oh, wow. the ignorance in my heart uh, to remove it. So thank you for that. Thank you. It's been my pleasure to have met you and known you. And uh, we'll see what God has in store for the future. All right. all right. God bless you all. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you for watching. God bless you until the next time. And don't forget to go register. Amen.